So you just have to be uh, uniform in applying this. Uh, another concern for EPS is, do you mean primary EPS, or diluted EPS, or partially diluted EPS? What do you mean uh, dilution? Well, sometimes your convertible bonds are converted, and then your number of shares outstanding increases, so that the EPS will go down. That's what we call EPS, uh, the diluted EPS. Another thing is your options, okay, stock options of your CEO may be exercised. If that happens, it will be diluted. Um, should we shall we include those things and then do it based on diluted basis or just primary basis without any dilution? Okay, you have to be um, uniformly uh, applying these things, and then before or after extraordinary losses or extraordinary profit, okay? You have to be uniform. And if you're, you are working with multi-country international comparison, accounting regulation may vary, okay? So you want to standardize those things. That's hugely complicated uh, process. For example, some countries may not expense the option to the CEO, some countries do. Uh, pension fund income should be counted or not, all those things, uh, you have to standardize those things, right? Um, then EPS, right? Uh, sometimes it may not be useful, right? PE ratio may not be useful sometimes. When is it? When the company has net loss, when you're EPS is negative, you're going to have negative P-E ratio, minus 10 times P-E ratio. It's not informative. It's not helpful. Okay? Does not give you any idea. So when your net income is negative or zero, you cannot use P-E ratio. Zero EPS, well, if you divide any number by zero, it will explode to the infinity. You cannot use it. So, um, how often, how often do we see that kind of non-positive net income for Korean companies at least? Well, around 20 to 30 times, 30% 30 of the times, okay? Uh, this is the portion, the proportion of Korean companies that have non, uh, what was it, negative earnings, okay, negative earnings in Korea, okay? So, if it is economic boom time, of course, many companies make profit. If it is financial crisis, like when you were in the kindergarten, is that right? Uh, or when you were, you know, high school kids somehow. And then um, these things jump up, the proportion of negative earnings, right? For these companies, we cannot use P. E ratio 30% of the whole sample drops off okay what's the problem there of course you will bias your judgment okay if you're working with only profitable companies okay you may be biasing significantly in a certain direction okay so you have to watch out for that right and then in that situation when your net income is in this kind of companies right when your net income is Negative, what do you have to do? You cannot work with P-E ratio, so what? Go up the ladder of income statement. Income statement, uh, if net income does not work, maybe operating income or EBITDA. What if this EBITDA is even negative? Well, then you'll have to go to sales multiple. You cannot have negative sales, right? In the first place. So, uh, work with those numbers in your income statement going up the ladder. If you look at the proportion of companies that have negative operating income, that's this guy. A lot less than when you looked at the net income, right? Quite natural, right? Operating income or EBITDA, less likely to have negative numbers there, right? So, you have to be flexible. Which multiple should we use in our project, term project? It's totally up to you, right? Totally up to you. But make a fair judgment about it and then say it out.
why you are using it. Okay? Descriptive statistic uh, or describing it is your second stage, right? second step. So, um, what is the average and standard deviation of your multiples out of the whole sample companies? Right? You need to have a good idea about it. Okay? Um, what is the median for this multiple is also, or even more important, because most of the time the multiple will be, the distribution will be skewed to the positive. Okay. Um, and then, how large are the outliers to the distribution and how do we deal with the outliers? Okay, you have to kind of think about those things. And then, shall we throw out those outliers okay, and forget about it? in our analysis? And the answer is no. Okay? Sometimes it's better to uh, use these outliers by imposing a smaller number. We call it Windsorizing. You're going to see it later. Okay? Um, so you have to determine about it. How uh, Are there any cases where the multiple cannot be estimated, just like what, what I talked about negative net income cases, right? Will ignoring these cases lead to any biases? Yeah, most likely you will be biasing aggressively for the pro profit-making lucky companies. So watch out for those kind of cases. How has this multiple changed over time? You want to uh, think about it. Just like this, right? Or historical PE multiple I'm going to show you later on, like this. Now, Histogram of PE ratio for Korean companies ever since 1981 up until 2014. Uh, median is 11. Now, here, what you see on the horizontal axis is PE ratio. Okay? Why do you have adjustment over here? Don't care about it too much. I just used the adjusted price. Adjusted for dividend payout and the stock splits minor issue. Now, now, what you see on the right hand side, um, it goes up until 80 PE ratio, 80 times PE ratio, and then spikes up like this. Does this mean the Korean companies have happened to have a lot of companies with 80 times PE ratio? And the answer is no. Whatever companies that had higher PE multiples than 80, I replaced those number with 80. Okay? 100 times PE ratio, 1000 times PE ratio, or million times PE ratio, there were some of them. I replaced those PE ratio for that company with 80 to visually show you how this distribution looked like. If we include, uh, if we did not do this visualization process, and try to draw this uh, diagram or, or histogram, it will look like crazy. One million over here and then one blip over here. Nothing in between. That would be really screwy. So winterize your variables first. Okay? It's okay to do that. Right? And for your regression also, working with winterized data works better. Some people call it massaging the data, but this is justified in every respect, okay? Um, so, <clears throat> that's that. And then PE ratio of all the firms in Korean stock market, okay, historically, was like this. So, red line shows you the median PE ratio, hovering around 10 times to 15 times. Average PE ratio is a lot higher because it is driven by those outliers. Okay? So you work with this median, it's much better. Um, once you understand the distribution, okay, describing process is done, move on to analysis part. Okay? Um, what are, here, the question is what are the fundamentals that determine and drive these multiples? Okay? Um, and then how do changes in these fundamentals change the multiple? Okay. Um, we're trying to identify those relations okay, uh, between your multiple and economic fundamental variables. Right? Um, for example, growth, right? and then the multiple like PE ratio. 
Um, sometimes they are not linear, okay? Sometimes they are, so you'll have to uh, think seriously, seriously about it, okay? Um, for example, PE ratio in analysis process, what do we do? Well, here we think about just one stage growth model. PE ratio is nothing but your price per share divided by earnings per share. That's simple. Uh, let's think about um, current EPS, which means last fiscal year's EPS. That's this guy. Um, and then you realize that price is nothing but your future dividend growing at a stable rate and using some discount rate like this. Time and time again we use it. So stick it in. And then what do you see? Well, next year's dividend is nothing but this uh, current year's dividend times 1 plus growth rate, and this guy stays there, and gives you this kind of relation, right? And then go down, it's nothing but the payout ratio times 1 plus growth rate over R minus growth rate, okay? So what do you see? Well, we see that payout ratio is positively correlated with payout, uh, in other words, that PE ratio is positively correlated with payout ratio and positively correlated with growth rate. Okay? It's kind of rational function, yuri hamsu, right? Rational function. But you see, when growth goes up, this guy goes up, that's positive. This guy goes up, that's denominator, so the whole thing goes up. Right? The growth rate is positively correlated with P-E ratio. And that's consistent with a common argument. When your company is like Tesla or a social network company that has really high growth prospect, your P-E ratio will be naturally high. It's not necessarily they are overvalued. No. Okay? Um, the next thing is this discount rate. It has to do with your risk, okay? I told you before, your value has two channels, cash flow channel and then what? Risk channel, okay? Those two, cash flow and risk. Cash flow positive, risk negative. High risk and the PE uh, ratio will be lower. That's what we find over here. PE ratio is a function of growth rate positively, risk negatively, and reinvestment needs negatively. Hey, what do you mean reinvestment needs? Remember, payout ratio is 1 minus retention ratio. That retention ratio is this guy. So because payout ratio is positively related, reinvestment needs or reinvestment ratio is negatively related to PE ratio. So if your company has a lot of reinvestment needs, your PE ratio will be naturally lower. It's not necessarily undervalued. Okay? So that's the thing you want to be, uh, be careful. Example, okay, is shown. Company ABC has the following characteristics. What should be the PE ratio based on the fundamentals? Your final exam questions will be like this, okay? So uh, your company has payout ratio of 40%. Gross rate of net income is expected to be 5% and your cost of equity is 15%. If you do the math in an analysis process like this, then you'll be able to figure out your fair PE ratio has to be 4.2 times. Okay, 4.2 times. Does that mean your actual PE ratio will be 4.2 times all the time? No, no. Your actual PE ratio in the market will be somewhat different from this guy. But this is your, uh, what the economic fundamental tells you. Okay? If your f uh, fundamental information is correct, your company has to have 4.2 times of PE. If, uh, if your company PE, actual PE is 8 times, then it is overvalued. If your company's actual PE is 2 times, that's undervalued. You have some fair judgment uh, base over here using analytical uh, relations, okay? That's the good part, uh, positive side of it. Now, a uh, perfect under, uh, perfectly undervalued company is extremely difficult to find it in this respect. 
If your company has a certain P/E ratio, there is a reason why your company has that kind of P/E ratio. Don't try to be, uh, don't be a quick judge of P/E ratio and say, you know, uh, simply because the company has four times P/E ratio, it's undervalued and let's buy it. No, no, no. Simply by comparing with your industry average, let's buy it. No, you have to uh, consider all these uh, fundamentals. Okay. Um, Perfectly undervalued company. If you were looking for the perfect undervalued assets, it would be one with low P/E ratio, which is cheap, with high expected growth in earnings, and with low risk and with high ROE. Okay. In other words, it would be cheap with no good reason for being cheap. Okay. It's like uh, looking for some. I don't know. Uh, the market is efficient. Okay. If there should be any uh, good investment opportunity there, it must have been gone away, right away. It's extremely hard to find any opportunity like that. So if any of your friends come to you and say, you want to go for blind date that I arrange, and then here is wonderful uh, lady or wonderful guy, and this, like this, like this, and you have to ask why, <laughs> right? As it turns out, there must be some reason why. Um, so brings us to our gloomy or uh, depressing reality. It's extremely hard to find an opportunity in the first place. They're taken. They're gone. All right. Um, perfect undervalued company, right? Uh, in the real world, most assets that look cheap on a multiple of earnings uh, basis deserve to be cheap. In other words, one or more of these variables work against the company. Maybe it has low growth, or high risk, or a low ROE in the first place. Uh, when presented with a cheap stock, right, here are the key questions. What is the expected growth in earnings? What is the risk in the stock? And then uh, how efficiently does this company generate its growth? Okay? This growth rate, okay, why, did, why is this ROE have anything to do with it? This growth rate has to do with your ROE in the first place. Remember, the growth rate is ROE times retention ratio, right? So that's why. Um, now, final step, application, right? Given the companies that are valuing, that we are valuing, what is the comparable companies, right? Maybe you want to, uh, you want to compare with identical twin companies. Um, but that's extremely hard to find, okay? Um, but here is the thing. You don't need to restrict to same industry companies, okay? When you're comparing Tesla Motors, okay? You don't need to restrict yourself to auto or, how do you say, car manufacturing companies only. You don't need to restricted to battery companies only. Okay? You can compare this guy with any other companies. As long as this, uh, the company has similar risk, like Beta, and similar cash flow characteristics, they should be uh, able to be your company's comparable firms, regardless of the industry. That's the key message here. Okay? Um, now, uh, ratio and expected payout ratio, okay? Well, uh, here's an example for Korean companies in last year, okay? Uh, I threw out the, what's that? The P-E ratio data on the vertical axis, on the horizontal axis, you see expected payout ratio. In the analytical process before, we identified positive correlation between uh, payout ratio and P-E ratio. The more likely to pay out a large amount, a large portion, your P-E ratio will be higher. Is it confirmed by the data? And it shows yes, okay, uh, for our Korean companies. And then I did the scatter plot over here, scatter plot. Um, and then here, what you see is not just the payout ratio, but expected payout ratio. So these companies have to be covered by 
stock analysts in the market. Okay? That means not all stocks are included here in our comparison. Not all stocks. The companies have to be in bigger size than smaller size to be covered by analysts in the first place. Okay? Larger stocks, but hundreds of different stocks. Fine. How about PE ratio? I Windsorized at a certain level. Okay? Nothing, uh, I mean, anything going beyond this guy, I imposed the PE ratio of 90, I don't know, 7 or something. Okay? So that's the scatter plot part. Now what? Um, you right click on, on any of these dots and you will be able to generate the trend line, which is the regression line in your Excel spreadsheet. And then it gives you an option whether you could show, display this regression equation and R squared together with it. Okay? Notice this regression is different from what we did in capital asset pricing model. Okay? Regression is regression, but we are applying it in different settings. Okay, okay, fine. What's the slope term? What's the intercept term? You find it over here. This is a quick and easy way of doing regression. There is a serious way of doing regression in Excel spreadsheet. Does everybody have this uh, regression function in your Excel? You already have it, no problem. Okay, add in those functions, good. Right, try those things and then you will be able to generate this regression results table. Okay? What I show you is the coefficient, standard error, key statistics of a slope term and then the intercept. And this slope term, 0.387, that's exactly what we see over here. Okay? That's this guy. And then this guy, 14.58, is nothing but this guy, intercept. The same number. Okay? The next question is, is this relation statistically significant? And it's yes, because the t-stat is bigger than 1.96 or 2, right? So statistically 5%, a significant level 5% is significant. And even more, right? Less than 1% level, because in that level it's like t-stat being 5, uh, 2.58 or something. Uh, it's much beyond that, okay? So we confirm the positive relation between payout ratio and PE ratio. What do we do next? Well, we want to identify some companies as overvalued and some companies as undervalued. Okay? Can we judge overvalue, undervalue by using this simple regression line? And whatever stocks that's below this is undervalued, whatever stocks that's above this is overvalued. And my answer is mm, not really, not really. Because there's some randomness in the data, we may want to impose some kind of band, okay? Safe band or efficiency band over here. I would say, uh, if the stock is, is, is located within one standard error, one standard error of, uh, of your regression line, okay, within this bound, plus and minus one standard error bound, I would say they are fairly priced, efficiently priced. And then if it is below this red line, okay, one standard error line, and I would claim it is undervalued, significantly undervalued. If it is above, then I would say it is significantly overvalued. That's how I would approach, okay? I set up uh, just one standard error rule, okay? But that's my personal judgment. You can determine your own way, okay? It could be two standard errors, then three standard error, okay? What does the standard error over here mean? Well, it's kind of a dispersion of this observation relative to this regression line. At each given point, right, you can think about a certain uh, normal distribution imposed, and then kind of a standard deviation kind of concept is over there, right? So 
one standard error. Almost 65% of your observations will be located within, and then the rest of them scattered around. If you impose two standard error, you may not be able to find any stocks under value. Okay? No opportunity at this data. Fine, that's what we also find. Okay, that's the reality. Okay, no surprise. But just as a pedagogical purpose, I impose one standard error rule. Okay. Um, right. How about other variables? P ratio is related to other fundamental variables uh, as well. For example, risk. Okay. Uh, P E ratio should be negatively correlated with risk. Right. High risk companies discounted more, so the P-E ratio will be lower naturally. Do we confirm this relation in our data? Okay. Uh, let's do it. Then the question becomes, what should be our risk measure? Okay. What should be our risk measure? We have beta. Okay. If we don't have beta, we can go for some alternative risk measure, but this is just good enough. So, we run the same regression. P ratio being on the vertical axis, the beta of each stock on the horizontal axis. Holy cow, do you mean we need to run the beta or the multiple regression, I mean the beta regression for hundreds of different stocks? Yes. Crazy, you will say. Uh, but let's see if I have some beta uh, variable available for you. Okay? Um, uh, so, what we find over here is that beta is the, or your P ratio is negatively correlated with beta. Okay? Your risk measure. High risk, low P ratio. That's what we find. Again, this is a regression different from your cap and regression. Okay? No, don't get confused. And we still have some in the intercept terms, right? Um, I did not show you the t-statistic because this is not significant. As you see visually, even though you see slightly negative tilting, it's closer to horizontal line, which immediately tells you that this slope term is not that significantly different from zero. Okay? So I could have just dropped this discussion. But I just kept this part because we still find some negative direction over here. Okay, negative direction. We're happy to use it. Okay, um, but still, if we try to impose one standard error rule, it will be wide over here and there. Um, anyway, because of the uh, insignificant result. Anyway, um, when you collect those data and run regressions, you will have to strike a balance somewhere, okay? You want to get to some companies that are closer to your company, uh, either in industry-wise or in risk characteristics or fundamental characteristics. If you try to be too strict, you will have almost no companies to compare. No data observation or small observations. That is a problem. Your statistical test or regression will be weaker over there. On the other hand, you may include all your stocks in the whole universe, even if it is totally different, but there will be a noisiness problem over there. So you have to strike a balance somewhere in between. There is no set rule about it. Okay? Only your experience tells you. At some point, you will have to massage the data, like Windsorizing the variables and things like that, and then trim off some of this part. Um, so that that depends on your judgment. That means when you are the consumer or reader of the analyst report, you have to think critically about what was done there. Well, the other person's re uh, report, think about what these guys did, massaging the data, and then pinpoint that, okay, and address those questions. That's the important part, okay? Um, and then the peg ratio is the thing we're gonna cover for, uh, spend the next 10 minutes, okay? Um, 
I guess most of you heard about this name before. Peter Lynch or not? Right? Peter Lynch. The Magellan Fund, fund manager, and it's a Fidelity Investments, a very famous guy, investment guru. He comes to the uh, CNBC interview quite often, uh, and Bloomberg or whatever, right? And then whatever he says, right, people try to follow him. Hey, investment guru, what do you think about this stock? Give me some insights. And he says, oh, buy this stock, sell this stock, blah, 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 blah. Primarily because peg ratio is beyond one, so sell it. Uh, peg ratio is under one, so buy it. Kind of a judgment, okay? Um, he invented this one, peg ratio, okay? So uh, there is a reason why we teach you, okay? Um, is it because peg ratio is something we have to follow all the time? No, okay? No. Unfortunately, this is a kind of a 반면 교사 kind of thing. How do you say? I don't know how to translate it in English language. By looking at some uh, negative example, you learn something about it and try not to do the same thing later on. Or try to be careful later, okay? Um, so, some fashions or fans come and go, sometimes snake oil salesmen everywhere, okay? And then some, uh, there's an attempt to get rid of the effect of growth rate and PE ratio. Essentially, the peg ratio was this idea, okay? Every now and then, PE ratio, people talk about it, but it is largely driven by growth rate in the first place. After getting rid of this uh, growth rate discussion, almost nothing is left. So, his idea was, why don't we neutralize the impact of growth rate by dividing the PE ratio by growth rate, okay? Maybe we will remove those growth rate in the analytical stage and then completely neutral with this growth rate. That was his idea, okay? Um, peg ratio is defined like this. PE ratio divided by uh, expected growth rate in earnings going into the future. Now, um, there's a problem with it also. Do you mean percentage growth figure? or uh, decimal places growth figure, uh, okay? There's a hundred times difference over there. So depending on which one you use, your critical peg ratio will be either one or 100, okay? So that's all already confusing a little bit. And then the uh, definition test is like this. Is the growth rate used to compute the peg ratio on the same base, like base year EPS? or over the same period, like two years, five years period, or from the same source, like analysts or group of analysts, right? There's no consensus to it, right? Um, and then, is the earnings used to compute the PE ratio consistent with the growth rate estimate? Uh, you should be careful about all these things when you use PEG ratio. Um, now, if you look at the distribution part, of peg ratio, it looks like this. Again, positively skewed, very much skewed. I again winterized all the things if the peg ratio is beyond 2.3 or something, I don't know. Um, and then, this is for the Korean companies over the history, right? Up until 2014. By the way, why didn't I include 2015's number? It's your job to do it, right? Um, for your project, and then think about it, okay? And I give you the data, okay? And then you construct it, and then see how, the, how you uh, find it, okay? Uh, similar or not, it's up to you, okay? Uh, peg ratio, again, it is highly skewed. And then, analytical part is like this. Again, we are using one stage growth model. Simply divide this guy by growth rate. Remember this guy's payout ratio. And we hoped that the peg ratio will not have growth rate in their analytical relations by simply dividing it and completely get neutral of the impact of growth. 
Unfortunately, that was not the case. It survived. Okay? And even more complicated way, we call it rational function again, right? Yuri Hamusu, okay? It gives you, later on you will see, growth rate and peg ratio will have U-shaped relations, okay? So it's more complicated. Um, so peg ratio is still a function of growth rate and is a function of risk and reinvestment, okay? You cannot get away from this growth impact, right? Yeah, five minutes left. <laughs> All right. Um, right. So if we chart a plot, okay, the mathematical relation between the expected growth rate and your peg ratio, it's not completely flat, right? If it is neutral, growth impact is not there, then it should be flat. But it's not actually when your company's growth rate is extremely low or extremely high, you will have very high peg ratio. You cannot simply say that sell this stock because it has a uh, peg ratio bigger than one. No, 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 no. It's justified by extremely low growth rate in the first place. Don't sell it right away. Okay? That's the idea. Okay? Um, so the message is this, again, people come up with new multiples each and every moment and then try to lure you, right? But uh, you have to try to analyze this thing using the fundamental variables of growth, cash flow, risk, okay? All those things, ROE, will determine your multiples, right? And some multiples, I mean, it's part of your job, right? To come up with new multiples yourself. Okay? Hopefully that will make sense after going through this analysis, uh, analytical process. Some people use what? Price per eyeball kind of multiples. What do you mean price per eyeball? Like if you're working with the Amazon.com kind of internet company, how much is your stock price per share Amazon per number of uh, people watching? Okay, it's like click number of clicks, so price per clicks kind of things. Um, those things are used commonly used as multiples. People come up with other multiples, try to uh, apply this kind of analytical process and try to understand it correctly. So that's the thing. Almost five or four minutes before the end. Um, you're free from now. Enjoy the Chukje World Festival or whatever. See you next week. <laughs>